Well, Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, it is the second day of 2022. That's a lot of twos, by the way. And many times, uh, as we're thinking about a new year, we're thinking about things that need to change. And for many of us, uh, we're thinking about resolutions. We're thinking about hitting the reset button, starting over. And for many of us, as we think about the changes that need to happen in our life, we often refer to that as turning over a new leaf or, or doubling down on our self-effort or maybe even thinking about uh, turning up the willpower in our lives. But what if instead of turning over a new leaf, God wants to give you a new life? And that's the whole point of this series over the next four or five weeks, uh, this Celebrate Recovery series that we're going to do. And if you hear CR, that's what we're talking about, Celebrate Recovery. And really what we're trying to do is to bring CR a bit from Sunday night to us here on Sunday mornings and integrating some of that liturgy over the next couple of Sundays. And you're going to hear testimonies. You're going to do uh, some of the responsive readings like we did at the beginning of this service. And then also we'll finish uh, with the serenity prayer as we finish out our, our day today. And there are principles uh, based on, that, that Celebrate Recovery is based upon. And we're going to focus on those principles over the next five weeks or so. And I'm going to focus on principle number one today. And this one that we've already said together, read together, I'm going to read it to you again. And that is uh, the R from uh, recovery. R, realize I'm not God. Admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Now, this comes from uh, a saying of, of Christ in the Beatitudes found in Matthew chapter 5. If you remember, uh, the, wor the word Beatitude itself means the blessed life. It's what we have understood of Jesus' main teachings about what it means to live a productive and fruitful life in the Spirit. And it's interesting because uh, Jesus says it a particular way here. He says, uh, for you to have a blessed life, you've got to come to a place of spiritual poverty. You have to arrive at a place that, of understanding that you are spiritually poor. In fact, he says here the key to happiness, the key to the, the joyful life is to, to achieve a certain kind of spiritual poverty. And, and spiritual, being spiritually poor uh, means that you recognize your inability to willpower through life. In fact, I think it's actually the, the contrary a thought to a, a resolution, if you will, because it's not that you need more willpower to change your life. You need God's power. And when you come to the end of yourself, what I mean by that is the end of your resources, the end of your power, the end of your strength, you will find God there at the end of your rope. It's what Celebrate Recovery, what they call hitting rock bottom, which means exhausting your personal effort and realizing that you cannot do it on your own. I mean, sure, uh, there are times where life experiences and the consequences of our actions will take us to rock bottom, but... You can, before that, preemptively come to the end of yourself and come to a point of surrender before you have to do it in, in the light of those uh, situations and circumstances of your life. And you can reach that point of hitting rock bottom now, which is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5, 3. That's a choice. It's a choice to become spiritually poor. It's saying to God, I can't do it. I can't do this thing called life. I can't do this, but you can do it in and through me. It's declaring, if you will, that you are spiritually poor. It's kind of like what we'd think of as declaring a kind of spiritual bankruptcy. Maybe it's something like this. I wish it was something like that. I wish it was that easy, right? Uh, just to verbalize it and to say that you declare bankruptcy. That's not what I mean when I'm talking about a spiritual bank bankruptcy. It really is to come to the end of yourself, to, to come to the end of your resources and to say uh, that, that I'm at the end of what I can do, that I cannot manage my life. What I'm talking about here is more than a simple acknowledgement of a problem. It involves a complete overhaul of your life. To declare, if you will, this is point number one, to declare spiritual bankruptcy, to realize that I can't do this for myself, by myself. I need God. And I cannot make a change if it not were for God working in my life. To admit that I need his power to override my sinfulness and to make me righteousness, to make me his righteousness. And I'm tired of managing my life, uh, crafting my own persona to make other people happy, but I need God to change me from the inside out. And then also to decide that I'm going to live my life for an audience of one, for my creator and my sustainer. And I turn over care and control of my life over to Jesus Christ, who is really the only one who can bring about that kind of change in me. The sad part, though, is that many people, many good people, many church people never reach this kind of place. And I hate to say it because I'm a product of the deep south and the buckle of the Bible belt. But I see many people who've never come to this point of declaring spiritual bankruptcy and allowing Christ to be the work in their life. 
I see people trying to manage their public lives as, as best they can within their own resources, a, a public persona, if you will. But on the inside, I see that there, there, on the outside, there's this persona of, of righteousness, but on the inside, people are shriveling up and dying on the inside in the private life. They might come to church, maybe. They carry themselves in the community with a certain socially acceptable, uh, polite, uh, Judeo-Christian ethic. Uh, they show just enough Christian niceness to convince their neighbors that they're okay. But the picture I get of many people that, that we have in our culture is that when you see that duck along the surface of the water and he's at, he looks like he's just coasting along there in the lake, but underneath the water, what's he doing? He is paddling as hard and as fast as he can and you never know it because that's underneath the surface. And so many people are paddling away frantically like this. Deep down, their hearts have not changed. And this is the hard part because it requires a heart change. And a sinful heart can only be throttled back, can only be behaviorally modified for so long, and that unbridled sinful nature eventually will emerge from that kind of repression. And what happens in those moments is we lash out or other people lash out at us and we begin to cope in unhealthy ways. It manifests itself in so many different ways, relational struggles, depression, anxiety, addictions of various kinds to illicit sex or drugs or alcohol, prescription medications, or even my drug of choice, food. But many people in our town have just enough Christian influence to be dangerous. And what I mean by that is they've inoculated themselves enough with just enough of the gospel message to actually be inoculated from the gospel. They've got enough head knowledge to get by without any real heart change. And on the surface, we have cultivated a fake culture of self-righteousness that honestly will damn many people, good people, to hell. Many people are trying to appear good enough and can't because they have not been supernaturally changed on the inside and there is no heart change. If that's you, listen, if that's you and you know that there's a problem and you find yourself like that duck and you're pedaling and paddling as hard as you can underneath the surface and nobody knows that they think you're just rocking along, along the surface of the water, I get you because that is the futility of trying to do life within your own power. Jesus addressed this uh, in the first century in the scriptures to a, a group of religious people who were zealous for the law. Okay, these people, these were known as the Pharisees. They had much of the same problem. They were zealous for the law. They were teaching a moral ethic and they had a desire for their culture to be good and to please God. But the teachers of the law and, and the Pharisees, even though they were well-versed in the scriptures, even though they had a lot of head knowledge, the problem is they did not allow that head knowledge to travel down the 18 inches required to go down to the heart and permeate their heart. And though they could quote scripture, and even though they could teach it and even rightly interpret it, it they never applied it to how they lived their lives. And they focused on the outside managing a righteous facade for themselves and even for other people instead of focusing on the source of the problem and that is this, the human heart. Listen to this in Matthew chapter 25, verses 25 through 28. This is Jesus describing the problem of hypocrisy. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the dish, the cup and the dish, and then the outside will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs who look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Jesus here is talking about point number two, that true Change requires a heart change. And Jesus used two pictures in this passage to describe what that kind of hypocrisy looks like. The people that focus on the, on the surface without, what, by, but also denying the core heart issue, cleaning the inside of the cup, you will. If you will, it's like this picture right here. You got this beautiful clean cup, but when you turn it over and look on the inside, yeah. It's like when around here sometimes I'll find out like one of those $40 tumblers, one of those really nice Yetis. And I'm like, man, score, I found one of those around here underneath the seats. And you open that thing up and guess what? It might have been sitting there for a few weeks. And it's like some kid's science fair project on the inside. Because what? Because on the, in listen, on the outside, it looked great. On the outside, it, it looked of value. But when you open it up, when you take the top off, you realize what's really on the inside. Jesus also talked about 
uh, whitewashed tombs. I've actually been to Israel and seen these whitewashed tombs. They're called os- ossuaries. I think ossuary, it means bone box. And it literally are family tombs that are boxes and, and they paint them. They keep them white and pure and beautiful on the outside. But on the inside, they place their dead relative. And after a few years, when the next person dies, they just push the bones to the back and put the next body in and push the bones to the back and push the bones to the back to the point where these ossuaries become full of dead men's bones. On the outside, uh, they're beautiful. On the outside, they've been painted white. This is what Jesus said here in Matthew. He said they're, they're beautiful and, and, and pristine on the outside, and yet on the inside, something is wrong. There's the stench of death full of dead men's bones. Basically, we have a cup and a tomb that are both hollow vessels, and deep down on the inside, they're dirty and dangerous. They're fake. They're dishonest. There's no substance when you get beyond the surface. And in this passage, Jesus is telling the Pharisees, you've got to get to the source of the problem. You've got to do some inside work. He says to them, you've got to clean the inside first, get the heart right, and the outside will take care of itself. The behavior will follow when you get your heart right. Both need cleansing on the inside to make them right and beautiful again. A cup, he says, needs washing. The tomb needs clearing, just like your heart. Your heart needs to be washed clean. Your heart needs to be cleared out. And listen, you cannot do that for yourself. You need God. You need God to step in. You need God to do what only he can do to offer you forgiveness of your sins and to clean you out of all unrighteousness. And you need his renewing power to fuel you to be able to live a supernatural life that honors him. He will clean you up and he'll set you straight if you'll just surrender to his care and his control. Now, we get that backwards sometimes. And I've even had counsel sessions with, with, with folks who say, you know what, I, I want to I get right with God. Uh, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. Uh, uh, but, but I've got to get a couple things right first. I've got to get some things cleaned up before uh, I will surrender or before I can get baptized. I've got to get some things right in my life. And I'm always cautious with folks like that because I say, wait, wait a minute. You, you've kind of got the cart before the horse. You've got it reversed. You come to Jesus. Listen, you come to Jesus because you haven't gotten your life straightened out. You come to Jesus because you're a sinner and you need a savior. You don't go to the doctor because you started feeling better. Why? You go to the doctor when you're sick. You go to the savior because you're a sinner. And you surrender to him and you follow him and you allow the savior to do the saving work. Let him clean you out and starts from the inside out. Jesus addressed this problem also in Luke chapter 12, verses one through three, the the heart issue that needs to be addressed. Luke 12, verses one through three. Meanwhile, when a crowd of many thousands had gathered so that they were trampling on one another, Jesus began to speak first to his disciples saying, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. This word that Jesus used, hypocrisy, is a very important word. It's a Greek word uh, used in dramatic settings. I'll tell you that in a moment. Verse two, there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. In this passage, Jesus is referring to a common Greek word when he says and calls the Pharisees hypocrites. It would have been a great mental picture to the Pharisees and to all who were listening to what Jesus was saying. Uh, This is a a picture I found of a first first century time of Christ, uh, Greek theatrical mask. That's creepy on many levels. I understand that. But it's a mask that the actors would wear. Guess what the word that they used for actors in the first century Greek culture? Hypocrites. Hypocrites were actors. And when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees here, he's calling them actors. He's, and this is, this is disturbing on so many levels. He's calling them pretenders. He said, you guys are putting up a front. You're pretending to be okay. You're pretending to be pristine. You're pretending to have it all together at first glance. But just like that cup, when I look a little deeper, when I go to the inside, I see a science experiment gone bad on the inside. All clean on the outside, but yet on the inside full of dead men's bones. I've heard it called putting on a church game face. It's the expectation that when you walk into church, you need to put up the facade. Pretend like you've got your life all together. Even if you're struggling, even if you're hurting, even if you're drowning and you're paddling as hard as you can underneath the service, surface, you come to church, you put on your church clothes and you put on your church facade because you can't let anybody really know how you're feeling. You can't let anybody really know what you're facing. We are fine. Our families are fine. Our marriages are fine. 
Our stress level is fine. Our finances are fine. Our ability to manage our addictions is fine. Our thought life is fine. Our spiritual life is fine. I'm fine, okay? You had a good week? Yep. Good. I'll see you next week. You had a good week? Yep. Good. See you next week. Many of us in the modern church don't feel comfortable or feel encouraged to talk about what really hurts us. There's not a, an environment created where we can talk about hurts, habits, or hang-ups. And many of those are heavy on our minds and we can't share. And I believe something is wrong. And Jesus is addressing this in the first century and it's no different than now in our time. And this is point number three. We have an unhealthy church culture. We have an unhealthy church culture. And this is troubling to me because the church should be the safest place to work through whatever struggles you're facing in your life. But many times, it's anything but safe. Randy Alcorn said this, a Christ-centered church is not a showcase for saints, but a hospital for sinners. We ought to be the main place to find help and hope when you're wrestling through the pain of hurts, habits, and hang-ups. But instead, I'm sorry to say this, but many churches have become community theaters <laughs> where we put on the facade and we put on the, the we perpetuate a, a fake reality uh, that we got it all together, that we have our nice little perfect community, and it's a lie. It's a lie we're saying to ourselves, and it's a lie that we're saying to each other. Have you ever heard of a, a social contract? A social contract? I'm going to give you the definition of a social contract. It's, uh, the social contract definition is when people live together in a society in accordance with an agreement that establishes moral and political rules of behavior. In other words, uh, there's a political or a social contract that we have among our, our church, the modern church, I believe, that is unhealthy. And it goes something like this. I'm okay, and you're okay. Okay? And I mean like that. I'm okay, you're okay. Okay? Think about it. I'm okay. How are you doing? Good. How's your week been? Good. How's family? Good. We're good. We're fine. We're great. I'm great. You're great. We're all great. You've got to act like you've got your life together. And if you don't have it all together, then you don't let anybody know. And I find out when it all crumbles as the pastor because you haven't told anybody. And if you don't have it all together, you don't let anybody know because you don't know how they're going to treat you. It's a vulnerability issue. In the one place that should be the most healing place for hurting people, we can't be honest because we might be afraid of being ostracized. And Christians can be some of the first people to throw people away who become damaged goods. I've heard critics say, the army of God is the only army I know who shoots their own wounded. And how does that make sense? And how did we get there? Some of it is uh, we're uh, embarrassed we're embarrassed to be exposed. Some of it is we're afraid of how we're going to be received. Some of it is that Satan has convinced us individually that everyone else is okay, everyone else is fine, and so there must be something wrong with me. And we carry that. And everybody else seems to have their lives all together from what I can tell, so what's wrong with me? I know better than most people as a pastor, because I hear it. I hear it on the other side. I hear it in the whispers. I hear it in the quiet place of people who come to me who are paddling just as hard as they can, but they don't let it be known in this room. And many times it's not even known to me until it's too late. And somehow in our messed up subculture, we've created a false expectation that if you're a real Christian, if your spiritual life is in the right place, then you're going to be free from struggles or issues. So if you have struggles or issues, then something is wrong with you or something is wrong with your Christianity. And so you better be quiet and keep it to yourself. So the pressure is on to have the false face, the actor's facade, to pretend that all is okay in order to fulfill that social con contract I was talking about because we've all got our lives together, right? I'm okay, you're okay, okay? And so we hide because we're not okay. We hide our problems, we hide our hurts, we hide our habits, we hide our hang-ups, and many of us live in the fear of being found out. And this is toxic. It's what Jesus called in Luke, the leaven of hypocrisy. And this is point number four. The leaven of hypocrisy breeds dishonesty, pride, and damage. 
The leaven of hypocrisy breeds dishonesty, pride, and damage. He said in verse 1, to be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. It's dishonest. It's a kind of evil legalism that leads to dishonesty. A dishonesty of the worst kind. Because not only are we lying to ourselves, but we're lying to each other in our fake little social contract. And this perpetuating lying creates a subculture of dishonesty. And I say this regularly in counseling, but the foundation, listen, the foundation of every relationship is trust. I sit with couples who have, that's been jeopardized in their, uh, in their lives. Somebody has done the dishonest thing. Somebody has lied. Somebody has gone outside of the marriage. And at that point, the trust has been jeopardized. It's very hard to rebuild trust. But I think about this, about our, our community of faith. What if we don't trust each other? What if we can't trust each other? What if we can't trust each other with our struggles? Do we, do we really even have a community? Do we really even have a depth to our relationships? Can I come to you, brother or sister, with the deepest needs of my heart and share what I'm struggling with without the fear of being ostracized or criticized? Will you love me like Jesus and walk me through restoration or will you discard me like damaged goods? Dishonesty. Pride. We become masters of sin management and behavior modification. We try to play God and we manage our own lives. This is part of the first statement that we talked about in, in, in these principles to, to admit that I am not God. We try to play God when we manage our own lives. It's exhausting, by the way. Maybe some of you in this room are exhausted because you've tried to keep up the whitewashed persona and that wears you down. And when, not if, when we mess up, how much damage is created when we try to cover up our sin and don't deal with it. In our pride, we hide. And this is the damage. Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. In our pride, we live in denial of reality and we play spiritual games, living dangerously close to falling, keeping up appearances on the surface, but denying the real change that need to happen on the inside. And this is where the damage happens. It damages you and it damages us as a community. This toxic hypocrisy. Jesus actually referred to it as leaven. And you know what happens when you put a little bit of yeast in that, that ball of dough? What happens? The, the yeast works its way through the entire lot, if you will. This is how sin is described in the Old Testament many times. And Jesus is describing the sin of hypocrisy when entered into a community. It works its way through the entire congregation because it's contagious. Hypocrisy begats hypocrisy, if you will. And once somebody offers that legalistic side of, I'm okay and I've got all my life together and you, I've got it all together, what's wrong with you? Then that causes somebody else to say, well, if that got it all together, then, then I need to pretend that I've got it all together so that it will not, and, and it just spreads as we see other people who are living seemingly perfect lives and they don't, they're not open about really what's going on in their hearts. But here's the reality. It's gonna be known. It will be known. It is known. How do we fix it? How do we fix this mess? Well, I'm glad you asked. This is point number five. We've got to take off the masks. We've got to take off the masks. Listen to this from Luke 12 again, verses two and three. Jesus told us, that he warned us of the sin of hypocrisy, and then he said it this way. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What you have said in the dark will be heard in the daylight, and what you have whispered in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed from the rooftops. In other words, Jesus says, there are no secrets really. By the way, uh, God knows everything. God sees us for who we are. Rick Warren said it this way, you're only as sick as your secrets. I love that because shame uh, is involved when we are not able to confess our sin. When we're not able to deal with our sin, shame paralyzes us. It, it's a spiritually controlling force when you have to hide, when you have to take on the role of God and try to control everything and manage your own hurts and your own habits and your own hangups, you inevitably will fail. And in your pride, you can't let on what's happening in this culture. But here's what I want you to hear from Jesus' words in Luke 12, 2 and 3. Your failures will be known. In fact, he says, they're already known. You can hide your problems from people for a while, but you can't hide them from God. He's omniscient, he's omnipresent, uh, omnipresent, and there is no hiding from him. In reality, we try to hide these things from our brothers and sisters, and inevitably, they will come out. 
because we can only manage it for so long. But here's the antidote. Here's the antidote to hypocrisy, and that is honesty. To display the truth, to be humble enough to admit our sin one to another and to our God and to allow the gospel to forgive us, to allow Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and to forgive each other, to bear one another's burdens, to confess our sins one to another and to foster transparency. Basically, what Celebrate Recovery does every Sunday night. I've told many people, I wish Sunday morning were more like Sunday nights at East Pickens. Ligon Duggan say it this way. We think that we can handle sin in our lives and experience by covering it up so that others don't see it, minimizing it so that it's not as, as bad as one might think. After all, looking good on the outside so that others think that we are right with God and pretending to be in fellowship with God whom we profess to believe. This is self-justification. That is one form of attempting to make yourself right with God. That is why Jesus so deadly opposed to this and his, to his disciples. It absolutely undermines everything that the Bible says from Genesis to Revelation about salvation by grace alone. It undermines what the Bible says about our sin being the fundamental thing that separates us from God and brings about dissension amongst one another. It gives the wrong prescription, the wrong solution to sin. We can't cover it up. Only Jesus can deal with it. And so it inoculates us to the very gospel of grace. This is why Jesus is so concerned to address his disciples about this. All of us can go through the outward motions and most of us can do a good job of fooling one another, even those very close to us, but God sees the heart. He knows our heart. And so all of the outward doesn't matter if the heart is not right. Jesus is empathetic about this. You cannot fool God because he sees the heart. Matthew West has a song right now on the radio that's very popular called Let the Truth Be Told. This are the lyrics. Lie number one, you're supposed to have it all together. When they ask how you're doing, just smile and tell them never better. Lie number two, everybody's life is perfect except yours. So keep your messes and your wounds and your secrets safe with you behind closed doors. There's a sign on the door that says, come as you are, but I doubt it. Because if we lived like that was true every Sunday morning, every pew would be crowded. But didn't you say church should look more like a hospital? A safe place for the sick, the sinner, and the scarred, and the prodigals like me. Can I really stand here unashamed knowing that your love for me won't change? Oh God, if that's really true, then let the truth be told. Oh, truth be told, the truth is rarely told. Am I the only one who says, yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, but I'm not, I'm broken. When it's out of control, I say it's under control, but it's not, and you know it. I don't know why it's so hard to admit it, but being honest is the only way to fix it. There's no failure, no fall, there's no sin you don't already know. So let the truth be told. What's the condition of your heart? What's the condition of your heart? Only you can answer this question. Now again, I want you to think about this principle, the first principle from Celebrate Recovery. And it really does uh, speak the truth in opposite of hypocritic Christianity. Realize I'm not God. I admit that I'm powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. These three statements, realizing I'm not God. You may say, well, I know I'm not God, but are you acting like him? Are you acting like you're in charge? Are you all powerful? Are you acting like you're all powerful? Are you managing your own life as best you can within your own resources? Then you've got to come to the point where you admit that I am powerless to control my tendency to do the wrong thing. Are you trying to do life within your own strength? Attempting to manage uh, your own destructive tendencies, which at best leads to behavior modification without real heart change? And then have you come to the conclusion that your life is unmanageable? Or are you attempting through willpower, not God's power, but will's power, willpower, uh, to change your life and change your behaviors? And if that's the case, I have a question for you. How's that working for you? Now, I like to take things for what they say and take the opposite of them to see if I believe what they really say that is true or not. So I'm going to take the opposite here of principle one. Here's my opposite, the converse of principle one. I think that I'm God. I am powerful enough to control my tendency to do the wrong thing and my life is manageable. You have to pick one of those two this morning. How are you living? Are you living in light of first, the first part here, the true principle? Or are you living according to the opposite of it? Are you living in light of the real, reality that you're not God or are you trying to play God? 
Have you come to the point that you have relinquished control of your life over to the only God, the God of the universe, who loves you enough to be able to forgive you and give you the power to do the right thing and trying to, to, and realizing that you can't manage your life or have you taken over God's role in trying to manage your life and don't let anybody know and just paddle on and here's the reality. That little duck wears out eventually. That little duck will sink to the bottom. I've seen it happen way too many times. But you've got to get to the point that you realize you're not God and that you're powerless to control the ten your tendency to do the wrong thing and to surrender, care and control over to the only God who can help you. To surrender and realize your life is not manageable and that you need Him to take over. Are you at that place of surrender? Have you trusted in him? I want you to bow your heads for just a moment. Which characterizes you? My prayer is that as you hear this, you go, man, I, that's right. But I'm so glad that God's in control of my life. I have surrendered to him and he is washing me clean and I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I live in my imperfection and I've embraced the fact that I need grace and I live in grace and I offer grace because I freely received it. And I'm walking in this place of joy and I know that God's in control and I trust him with all my steps and I'm in that place of surrender. And I'm, I can be open and honest. I've got an accountability partner. I've got some people right now that I can do life with and really just show myself wart, warts and all. And there's such uh, beauty in that and they love me and receive me and offer grace to me. And we're in that place and I'm growing with God. I'm in for, I feel the forgiveness of God over, overflowing in my life and I'm so grateful. I'm a grateful believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, you might realize I'm trying to play God. I'm managing my life. I'm in charge. I, I might come to church. I might have the, the game going. But I am like that little duck. I'm just paddling as hard as I can, trying to maintain this thing above the surface, and I'm about to drown. And if I'm honest, I need God to intervene because I can't do this myself. I need a heart change. I need God to step in. Because my life is unmanageable and I can't control myself. And I know where this leads. And right now God might be giving you a hint of where this all leads if you don't surrender to him. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Many times people end up in my office when they've gotten <laughs> past that point. And it breaks my heart as a pastor. But just maybe, if God could help you in this moment to declare spiritual bankruptcy to declare that you need him desperately and to take off the mask and to be real with God and man and say, I need him. I need forgiveness. I need the gospel. I ain't playing this no more. I'm taking it off. I'm going to be real before God. If that's you. In this moment, you confess your sin to him right now. Confess your need for him. For some of us, maybe it's just a time of rededication. I'm going to re rededicate my life to him. I'm going to re-declare my bankruptcy. I, I need you desperately, Jesus Christ. I need your forgiveness. I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I surrender, care and control of my life over to you. I turn my life over to you. I can't do it. I can't manage this. I need your power to work in and through me. I can't will this stuff to happen anymore. I'm not going to pretend anymore. I want the truth to be told. Lord Jesus, we desperately need you. This is such a gut punch. But we need it, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us, God, for fostering the facade. Help us to be honest with each other and community. Grow in us a grace, an appreciation of grace enough to receive grace and to dispense grace when needed. I pray if anybody's at that point, Lord, of surrender, that they would cross that threshold and surrender it all to you, Lord. Surrender their lives to you today, God, their heart. They know they need a clean heart, God. They would admit that and ask you to clean them out, Lord, from the inside out. Forgive us, God, for spending so much time on the outside of the cup and not the inside work. 
I pray that you'd kill the leaven of hypocrisy in our church and churches around us, Lord, that we could foster humility and honesty to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to stand. This altar's open if you want to come and pray. It's the first of the year. Let's rededicate our hearts and our minds to this end. That we would walk in the power of God's grace. If you've pr- trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ today, or maybe you realize, I need to trust him. I need to surrender my life to him fully. I'll be down here to receive you and pray with you. This altar is open. You respond as the Lord leads. Yeah.